Okay, greetings and good afternoon to all, and also good evening, the ones in, in Europe, in Spain specifically. Thank you for accepting our invitation to another webinar for this semester. Today's title is Born Accessible, Addressing the Accessibility Skills Gap Through Curricular Transformation, with our especially invitees or speakers today, Kate Sonka and Rolando Mendes from Teach Access. They are our new or more recent corporate partners and we are very excited to have them aboard right away in this webinar. Uh, let me see if I can, as usual, uh, thank you for, uh, you all for the time and support to these events that aim to provide educational experiences and discuss pertinent topics as part of the HEADS mission to promote the integration of technology into higher education. Today, we have more than 100 participants registered from than for more than 25 higher education institutions in Puerto Rico. We also have some of them in the US, including organizations. Hopefully, all of them can join us today. So far, we have 40 people connected. So we have a nice group um, and we hope that the rest can join us at the proper time since we have uh, this last Sunday, the time change in the States, but in Puerto Rico, we still the same. So we hope that nobody uh, get confused with the time zones and the time change. Greeting to all again, we hope that this webinar will be of great benefit to everyone. Before we start the webinar, we always like to emphasize and share a few announcements. First of all, for the for your convenience, closed captions are available in English for this webinar. To activate this feature, click on the CC Live Transcript button that you will find in, in your screen if you need it, if you think you need it, although I know that Rolando and Kate speak very clearly uh, English, but in case you need it, it's available. Also, use the chat to share your questions and comments. And I already spoke to them. They, they if, if you have any, any questions during the presentation, feel free to write it on the chat and I will interrupt them. They say it's okay with them. So, uh, so they can clarify any topic at that time. Also at the end, remember that we always allow between five to 10 minutes uh, for the Q&A se uh, sessions and you, are, you can write your questions or comments on the chat as well. Uh, keep your microphone on mute to avoid interruptions. I know that Zoom provides us the feature to uh, don't allow anyone to unmute, but in case this feature fail, please make sure uh, that always your microphone, microphone is in mute. And also very important, access the link in the chat that Isaris, our executive assistant in putting in the chat, the link to request the certificate of participation, or you can use, if you are in a laptop or in a desktop, you can use your cellular camera uh, to uh, use the QR code and, and submit the information to request the certificate. Remember that before you press the submit button, please make sure that your email is correct spell out because if not you're not gonna be able to receive the certificate okay and also that your name is very uh, Bella, uh, uh, spell out uh, correctly as well uh, in the next 24 hours you will receive an email with the certificate and also the link to complete a short electronic survey in the same email to help us evaluate this webinar and also help us identify identify which head services and initiative can support not only you as a faculty or a, a, as administrator, but also to your students. And also we would like to uh, see your recommendations and how is the best way to promote these services. The service is anonymous and it takes around five minutes to complete. We truly appreciate the time to complete the service since your feedback is very important for us. Also, and as always, we emphasize that we need your support and your 
help to invite others to register and also participate in our webinars and events. Please help us spread the word and also follow us in our social media account. We have, as you may know, uh, accounts in Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and everything that we record, we publish it like this webinar in our website under the menu pa next and past events and also in the Heads YouTube channel, you can find the repository of all of our events. But the next uh, uh, event or initiative that Heads is promoting is the deadline to submit your, your proposal for the Heads Best Practices Showcase and um, save the day for January 11 and 12. 2024, we will be in person presenting different best practices. We already received uh, like a dozen, but we are waiting for more. And uh, this time, not only faculty and administrators are able to submit their proposal, but also students that have different projects that integrate technology in any academic area. So please enter to our website, see the information of the best practices, and please don't be shy. Share your expertise, your experience with your uh, projects and let us know. If you have any doubt, if you need any additional dates to submit, please let us know by email at info at heads.org and we will definitely will uh, help you on that. Also, next week, is already there. We will have in collaboration with the Zoom Student Experience Summit in November 14 and 15 at the Centro de Convenciones in Puerto Rico. We will have this Student Experience Summit and so far, we have more than 5,000 students coming to attend this event. We have the collaboration not only of local higher ed institution, but also through heads, we invite others from the states and also our university in Colombia, Universidad Cooperativa de Colombia. One of our members is coming, so we are very excited to welcome everyone there. So please, if you haven't uh, helped uh, promote this among your students, if you know any students that may want to continue that is already in college and want to continue master or doctor degrees, please invite them to take advantage of this. And we have two more webinars coming in December. The first one is going to be in Spanish with the topic Liderazgo para los que buscan marcar la diferencia with Dr. Albert Troche from Inter-American University in Bayamón. That will, this will be in December 1st. It's a Friday at 10 a.m. Atlantic time, Puerto Rico time. And that's going to be 9 a.m. Eastern time. And then... After that, we will have in December 7, it's a Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, Puerto Rico time, uh, the topic, uh, maximizing your college and university experience. We would like to finish with these two topics for students, but we always invite faculty administrators to join us since these topics are very pertinent for everyone. Also, uh, we always like to emphasize the access uh, 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 and the invitation to access and promote among your students and colleagues the access to the Peterson Test Press where you can find scholarships, practice tests like PCAT, GRE, LSAT, NCAT, and more than 100 tests are there. And also you can download the ebooks to get prepared for those tests. And to enter is very easy. Just go to the Heads Student Placita in the Heads website, click in the link of Peterson Test Prep. And if you don't know the passcode of your institution, please send us an email at info at heads.org with the name of your institution. Likewise, you can access the Peterson Career Prep and this database is more into search for jobs and internships, create your resume and find career advice among other services. And the password is the same to the uh, of, for both uh, databases. Remember again, if you don't know the passcode, when you click on the link on the name of your institution, please send us an email and we will definitely send you right back your password. Now we are we are ready to start our webinar, but first we would like to read a, a summary of our speakers. Ladies first, I'm going to start with Kate. So Kate Sonja is the Executive Director of Teach Access. Previously, she was the Assistant Director of Inclusion and Academic Technology at the College 
of Arts and Letters at Michigan State University. She holds a master's degree in bilingual bicultural education from DePaul University and has more than 12 years of experience in higher education. She has worked to improve teaching and learning with technology through course design and support, experiential learning, training and mentorship for faculty members and students. And we also have today our former colleague, Rolando uh, Mendez. He's still a colleague, but I mean colleague when he was at the Inter-American University. Now he holds the position of the Director of Education at Teach Access. Previously, he worked at the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico in different roles, studying in, Pon in the Ponce campus, and then he moved to the Amin Amin Central Administration. And he has over 18 years of experience in higher education, managing projects related to faculty development, instructional design, student supports, quality assurance, and technology adoption. And Rolando is an advocate for accessibility, equity, and inclusion in education, and has been a valuable collaborator of heads in several initiatives, like the best practices showcase that he has presented in several times. So, Thank you both. I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation right away. So you can start enjoying uh, this webinar. So far we have how many uh, uh, joining us? Let me see. And please ask uh, 550. So a nice group. So go ahead, Sonja. I think you are the one who uh, will be sharing. Right. Excellent, yes, we can see. So I'm gonna be mute and hide my camera so you can have control of the room. Go ahead. All right, excellent. Thanks everyone. Uh, hola, buenas tardes. Thank you for having us here today. Um, really excited to be with all of you. Um, we're here to talk about uh, addressing the accessibility skills gap through curricular transformation. So um, I'll talk for a little bit about who we are and what we do. Um, and then Rolando will share more about what we're doing uh, and what that looks like or could look like um, on your campus. Um, so we've already been introduced, but I do want to sh quickly share our email addresses that are here on the screen. Um, you can reach us. I'm at Kate, K-A-T-E, at teachaccess.org. And you can reach Rolando at Rolando at teachaccess.org. So you can email us at any point uh, if you have questions or, or want to, to get more involved. So what we'll cover today, um, I'll talk about who we are, um, accessibility in general. Many of you might already be familiar with it or working in these spaces already, so we won't spend too much time there. Um, we'll make the case for why you should think about teaching accessibility to your students um, and supporting your faculty who are teaching. Um, we'll talk about what that could be. What could you be teaching, those accessibility fundamental concepts and skills? Um, and then offer uh, a phased approach to curricular transformation um, on what it could look like and then uh, have time for some Q&A. So who we are. Um, so first, we before I get into this, want to talk about something we call the accessibility skills gap. Um, and so this is a gap uh, in accessibility knowledge and digital skills that as students are graduating and entering the workforce, they don't know what accessibility is. They don't know necessarily what disability is, um, or not many of them. There might be a few. Some of you out there might already be teaching it, um, but there really just isn't a wide group of, of students, you know, a, a breadth of students who know about this. Um, in an effort to understand what that this gap looks like, um, in 2018, an organization called the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology conducted a study where they asked industry partners and really at that time a lot of big tech companies, technology companies, to understand this gap. Um, we'll share some findings in a moment, but we refreshed it uh, in 2022 because we thought this has been a few years, let's try and find out if this gap had closed. Um, and really we found it hadn't. This idea that students aren't graduating knowing what accessibility is because industry really wants that. 
they want students, recent graduates, to come in and know something about accessibility and or disability so that products and services, apps, websites can be made accessible from the beginning so that people with disabilities are able to interact with materials and resources right away. So um, some of the findings uh, that I have up on the screen here from the refresh that we did in 2022 is that 75% of the respondents, the people who responded to our survey, saw a moderate to significant increase for their employees uh, or, or for employees with accessibility skills in their organizations in the last five years. So in the last five years, 75% of them said there really is an increase for our employees to know about this, to have these skills. And 86% of them said they anticipate the demand for the knowledge and the skills around accessibility to increase. Um, and then only 2% of them uh, said it was easy for their organization to find candidates who have these skills. So what we're seeing is that there is a demand. Industry wants people who know about accessibility and disability, but they're having a really hard time finding people. So this is the gap that we're talking about and who we are as an organization. So this is why we exist, uh, is because of this gap. And what does that actually mean when we're thinking about accessibility? What is it in terms of what is it, why is it, and who is it? So I'm going to move through this pretty quickly um, so that we can leave time for uh, sort of um, the information that Rolando is going to share in a moment. Um, but you do have access to this. You can come back to it and revisit it. But if you aren't familiar with accessibility, um, it's a practice of removing barriers, which would prevent people with disabilities from accessing information, um, digital content. Um, it's a way that we've designed things to be accessible and inclusive from the beginning. Um, and it's always important to remember that um, what we do to make something accessible for one person with a certain type of disability may not work for another person with a disability. Um, and so we do our very best to make things as accessible as we can with the understanding that it's a constant process, that we're consistently going back um, that we're prepared for a user to come to us and say, I can't use this, even if we did make it accessible. We know that it's it's a process. It's We, we continue to move through it. Um, so that's what accessibility is. Why should we care about it? Um, there are a lot of people with disabilities in the world. Uh, so there's a huge population. Um, the World Health Organization estimates there are 1 billion people worldwide that are living with a disability or have a disability. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States estimates that one quarter or 25% or one in four of all US adults have a disability. And so what this means is you, you know someone who has a disability or maybe you are someone who has a disability or will be uh, impacted by disability in the future. And so it affects all of us. It's the only group that we can all enter at any point in time. And so it really is everywhere. And it's something that we really want to consider um, as we think about creating inclusive societies. There's a whole bunch on the screen here. Again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with it, um, but just to give you, in addition to societal consideration where we know there is a population, large population, there are legal considerations. Um, and while we would love everyone to always do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, sometimes we need laws to help people do those right things. And so up on the screen here, we've listed a few um, of those legal considerations that um, your institutions might be uh, looking at or have heard of, or just in general things that exist out there. So of course, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act um, that's now 33 years old. Um, there is uh, something called Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act from 1973 um, that impacts federal agencies. Um, there's an Accessible Canada Act um, in line with sort of some of the th same things um, that the ADA covers. Um, there was a Dear Colleague letter, maybe some of you saw it, um, that the Justice Department and Department of Education um, sent out very recently to institutions to say, hey, make sure things are accessible. Um, there's also a European Accessibility Act. And then we have a link to additional 
regulations and policies. In no way is this an exhaustive list. Many other countries in the, in the world have their own uh, laws or regulations, but why it's important for all of us to be aware of, aside from our jobs, our day-to-day -day jobs, is that this is the environment we're sending our students out into. So our students might graduate and go work for Google, or they might go work for um, whom whoever. Those multinational organizations have offices in some of these countries where these materials have to be accessible under the law um, of that country. And so not only is it important that we know about it for our own work, we, we want students to be aware that this exists so that as they go out there, they understand they, they're doing this across the world. There's also some quality considerations. Um, and so again, many of you out there work in these spaces. Um, you're familiar with some of these rubrics, but we also shared um, uh, the SUNY Online uh, Course Quality Rubric or OSCAR. Um, Quality Matters, of course, has uh, some information in their standard eight around accessibility. There's also the ISTE standards. Um, again, not an exhaustive list, but an example of the spaces where accessibility um, appears. And so as we're thinking about what we do in our online courses, we want to include these. And then again, a long list of texts you can, you can go back and review later and not exhaustive either, um, accreditation considerations. Uh, and so looking at some of the accreditation organizations like um, Higher Learning Commission, for example, or um, Middle States Commission on Higher Ed uh, and others have um, items within their guidelines that talk about um, inclusion or higher learning commission, for example, talks about an informed citizenship. Uh, so there are spaces where accessibility and disability education could appear under that. Um, and then of course, uh, we also mentioned program accreditation. So any of you who perhaps have programs accredited by ACM, Association of Computing Machinery, um, so like computer science programming, uh, engineering, et cetera, there are guidelines for those organizations that talk about um, the type of inclusive learning that, that we want our students to get. So who benefits from this? I believe there, someone shared this recently in one of your um, uh, recent uh, webinars, I think, uh, but I'm not gonna spend again too much time on it, um, but really what this, this demonstrates, there's an image up on the screen um, and it's from the Microsoft Inclusive Design Kit. Um, and it's really demonstrating how, again, any of us can be benefit, any of us can benefit from accessibility um, and experience disability at any time. It could be permanent. Um, it could be a temporary situation. Perhaps you broke your arm um, or you have an ear infection, so you can't really hear very well. Um, or it could be very short, like a situation. So um, up on the screen, someone, someone uh, is holding a baby. Um, under touch. And so one of their arms is being used to hold a baby, um, which means if they're trying to, you know, open the, unlock a door, close a car door, something like that, in that moment, in that situation, you have use of one of your arms. Um, and so it's really meant to indicate um, and show the various ways that that disability can, can impact any of us at any time. Um, so the case for teaching accessibility. I'm gonna go into that really quickly. Um, and then Rolanda will share some great resources and suggestions for you after this. Um, but what is the state of accessibility in education? Um, so any of you out there uh, who have been working with education, feel free if you'd like to drop it in the chat. Um, I can take a peek at that later. Rolando can, can see what people are sharing. Um, but curious if any of you have experience with accessibility, if you've been working in this space at your institution, but what we've seen mostly in the work that we're doing is that universities and schools um, are thinking about accessibility for their websites. Um, so when students are coming to um, the website for the school or faculty, um, procurement um, and purchasing for technology. So thinking about the software that we're purchasing um, to be used on our campuses um, and also the ways that we teach and ensuring that we're teaching accessibly. So the idea that the materials that I'm using in my classroom have been made accessible. Perhaps I use the accessibility checker on my syllabus in Word, or I added captions to my videos, my lecture videos. 
Um, I've added alternative text or alt text to my the images I use in my class. Those are all very important and we need to be doing those things across all of these. Um, and we should also consider the ways we could be teaching our students about it, right? So that they know about it and they take this knowledge out there so that we can try and keep working on closing that skills gap that I talked about. Um, there are some institutions, maybe some of yours out there, who have been teaching accessibility to your students, um, but it's it's still not, not very many. Um, there's still a lot of room for growth here. Um, so that our students are graduating and going out there and, and can do this work. So just for a quick definition to make sure everyone's picking up on this, when we're talking about teaching accessibly, uh, that involves making sure that course content, technologies, and activities are accessible to learners with disabilities. So this is the actual content we're using, um, possibly even the ways that we're teaching. So any of you um, who engage in Universal Design for Learning or UDL. They're the things we do to make our learning environments accessible and inclusive. This could be things like adding captions to our videos, which I mentioned, um, alternative text, using descriptive hyperlinks. So by that, I mean, instead of saying something in my syllabus, like if you would like to see the policy, university policy about something, click here, and I make click here the link. Instead, I could make the entire, the university policy on um, whatever it might be. I could turn that whole phrase into a descriptive hyperlink, which indicates then to students where I'm about to take them or where they might go. So this is teaching accessibly. This is helping our students access the materials or ensuring that they can. Teaching accessibility, which is what we're focused on as an organization, um, is actually you all as educators or your, your colleagues teach students about accessibility, that it even exists, that it's a thing we should be doing. Um, it could be straightforward as introducing a lesson or an activity on accessibility in your course. Could be an, about accessible design or disability. Um, an example that we have up here, maybe you're teaching a writing course. Um, could you talk to students about plain language? Um, so using plain language, easily understood language, um, and maybe also talking about the use of anti-ableist language. Um, so what sort of phrases could we avoid? Should we avoid because they are ableist? Um, so this is teaching accessibility. So this is in your classroom doing things so that students um, know, know that it exists and, and can go out and uh, take this knowledge with them. Um, so why teach it? I will I will get through this pretty quickly, um, but it's an essential design component of systems and processes. Um, it is a standard in some industries already. There are industries who are who expect that things will be accessible. It's becoming a standard in others. Um, assistive technology. So this is technology that people with disabilities use. Um, they're increasingly becoming embedded in industry, government, and private practice. People are using assistive technology to do their jobs, um, to access information. Um, we talked a little bit about it as a legal requirement and a best practice. Um, and then really, I think the important piece about it is that it's demonstrating to our students as we teach it, um, a real and actionable commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those are so important and there's a lot of work being done in the DEI space. Um, let's make sure disability is included in that as well. And as we're teaching our students and our colleagues really um, about DEI that we're including disability in that work. So I think that's where I pause and I will turn it over to Rolando, but um, before he takes it away at Rolando, were there any questions or anything that came in um, that we should address quickly? Okay, is this so Rolando? Far? No. I don't no. see any, Ella. You, you think in the chat. Okay, go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Rolando. Take it away. Thanks, Kate. So Kate mentioned uh, that there's an accessibility skills gap out there, and industry is looking for students entering the workforce with accessibility skills. But what do we mean about uh, accessibility concepts and skills? So here is a list uh, of six broad categories that our partners, industry partners, and volunteers sat down and started thinking about which concepts and skills should people know when entering the workforce and uh, to be considered to have some basic understanding of accessibility. 
So the first one is disability is one of the first topics and it's fundamental because accessibility work is uh, for people with disabilities. Second is societal context and historical perspectives. The third one is user interface facilitators and barriers and with examples. Uh, number four is common assistive technologies or AT. The fifth is best practices for product development and six apply techniques in different fields. This means what does it mean to apply the principles of accessibility in marketing and health sciences and public health and statistics scores, et cetera. So here's an overview of uh, the micro concept that you can start teaching in your courses. But when it comes to disability topics, it could be common types of disability, current demographics, statistics, understanding ability from a functional approach. The same with the impact of disability in daily living activities. Also something like uh, Kate presented, the temporary, permanent, and situational limitations related to uh, disability. Next slide, please. In terms of societal context and historical perspectives, uh, we can talk about identity and cultural norms, accessibility at the civil right, ADA history and basic rules, as well as other uh, landmark legal cases and pending regulations and implementations, or the W3C and the web content accessibility guidelines, which some of you might be familiar with. In terms of user interface facilitators and barriers with examples, we could teach them about graphical user interface, touch and tactile screens, gesture input, video and reach media, speech to test, speech commands, uh, providing accessible instructional supports and training on assistive technology and accessibility features. In terms of common assistive technologies, types of assistive technology like screen readers, captioning switches, magnifier, refreshable braille displays, et cetera, evaluating AT, using AT as well, and exploring how these technologies have become from specialty AT to mainstream, and we see them integrated in many of the devices that we use nowadays. In terms of the uh, best practices for product development, uh, accessibility as a design principle and not a feature that is uh, thought of or integrated after the product or the service has been designed or launched. Also, accessible design as an output of universal design, user research, accessible research, how to validate and user test, communicating out with marketing, customer support, technical writing, and communication of uh, return on investment, impact analysis, et cetera. And finally, apply techniques like semantic code, headings, landmark buttons, accessibility APIs and frameworks for iOS, Android, areas, uh, language and platforms, testing tools, use cases, information architecture, core principles, et cetera. I know some of these uh, concepts, if you're not familiar to them, might sound very heavy, might sound very obtuse, but don't worry, we're here. We can explain a couple of them. But in terms of how do we do, we, we get to teach them, we just, review a couple of the things that we can start teaching uh, to our students, but how can we do it? So we can start at the syllabus level by adding accessibility to the course's name or description. Sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds because we have to go to curricular committees, et cetera. But when it's available, let's start adding accessibility to the course's name or description. It can be also as simple as including access accessibility focused course goals. Like one of the overarching goals of our syllabus is achieving something related to learning about accessibility. Also including accessibility as a course topic, um, any of these topics that we just discussed, we're including accessibility as an evaluation criteria for pro course projects or assignments. Uh, this is something we've seen that faculty often do. It's like in a typical project presentation or uh, any activity, group activity that students have to do throughout the semester, they include accessibility as part of the requirements for evaluating that project, that the students took into consideration those accessibility principles when creating uh, their presentation or the project, et cetera. In terms of course level, what things can we do to teach accessibility to our students? We can, I mean, if we don't have the expertise, if we think we still need to build some capacity, we can do something as easy as inviting a guest speaker to share their experiences and insights about accessibility, about disability. We can also create discussion prompt related to disability and accessibility. Uh, one of the discussion prompts that uh, I've seen faculty apply is like, what, does, what do you think accessibility means to you as a computer scientist or 
as a graphic designer, as a marketeer, as a manager, as a uh, person that works in finance, etc. Also, you can assign a reading, uh, reading or a video about disability and accessibility. If you don't know where to look, we can help you with that. Also, organize demonstrations of assistive technology. Let's gather the group and start uh, exploring how do we use a screen reader or Apple's uh, voiceover feature, or we start using all of these other uh, assistive technologies, also including hands-on exercise, such as capturing a short video that we're uploading to YouTube or creating an accessible document uh, in Word, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, or uh, PowerPoint presentation, or evaluating a website's accessibility with the many accessibility checkers that are out there. Also to have students research disabilities, accessibility related legal cases, accessible design guides, and best practices for assistive technology. In terms of uh, program level, what can we do? We could include curricular materials when we're designing a program, uh, or if it we're going through a curricular revision, we can start wondering how can we include curricular, curricular materials like readings, videos, et cetera, about accessibility or from disabled uh, uh, authors. That is part of you know, the DEI initiative. We have to see it also in the curriculum as well. How do we promote uh, disability and accessibility topics for research, creative, and design projects? Uh, maybe we can encourage uh, for master re uh, master programs research or for doctoral program research or for a creative or capstone project or senior design project. Uh, also, we can add accessibility requirement as criteria for regular creative or design projects that we have in the uh, in the program or in our courses. Uh, we can create an introductory course to disability awareness and accessibility either as a re uh, elective, which is probably the easiest way to get it in, in terms of uh, getting it established in, in terms of curriculum or as a program requirement. Also, we can incorporate accessibility concepts and skills across the curriculum. So in this first course, the intro course, we see just a bit of, of these principles and these concepts, and we start building on those as we go through the entire program. Finally, there are things that we could do also at the institutional level. We could create an introductory course to disability awareness and accessibility uh, in an ideal world as a general education requirement, also including teaching, researching, and publishing about accessibility as a requirement for faculty annual reviews. We, uh, we know that we include other things such as uh, creative work, uh, research, community service, we might be do something new and uh, reaffirm our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion and start including uh, these types of activities center or revolving around accessibility as a requirement for those annual reviews. Also, we could incorporate teaching accessibility and teaching accessibly both in academic policies and practices. We could develop an institutional policy that fosters or facilitates faculty implementing uh, those two practices. Also very important, we always say we want to uh, build capacity. We also want to have our faculty and students learn about different topics. It's always funding is uh, required for this. So allocating funding for building accessibility knowledge uh, in faculty and students, and also offering extra and co-curricular activities to increase, uh, increase accessibility awareness. So we've gone through, you know, the concepts that you can start teaching uh, about accessibility, about disability. We've gone through the things you can start doing in your syllabus, in your course, at the program level, or maybe at an institutional level. But how do we do it? Where do you, we get all this information? So uh, this is not a shame, it's not. Uh, we're te well, we're teaching this and we're focused on supporting faculty and uh, academic administrators across the United States and Puerto Rico and learning about accessibility and teaching it to their students. And we have a couple of uh, many, we have various and uh, free uh, programs and resources for faculty and students. For students, we have two programs. One is called the Teach Access Student Academy, which is a monthly uh, Zoom a meeting that where students get to learn from an industry expert or a disability advocate about a topic related to accessibility. So far, we've covered uh, disability, assistive technology. Last week, we had uh, someone from LinkedIn uh, discuss the principles of accessibility. In January, we're having my dog, Jaffe, talk about neurodiversity, and then we're going to explore different uh, applications of accessibility in communications, events, and then careers in accessibility for those students who are interested in 
uh, pursuing a career in accessibility. Also, complementary to that program, we have the Student Ambassadors Program, which is a more sustained approach to helping students become advocates for accessibility and for teaching accessibility in the curriculum, in their institutions, and in their majors. For faculty, on the other hand, we have Teach Access by Design. If you feel like you don't know much about accessibility and you would like to start getting to uh, get familiarized with these topics, you can start with Teach Access by Design, which is a 10-week online facilitated course that introduces faculty and uh, administrators to uh, what is disability, accessible design, and universal design for learning. We also have the Teach Access grants, which are stipends that we award to faculty in the amounts of 1000 2500 and 5000 for creating materials to teach uh, accessibility. These materials are then incorporated into one of our uh, resources, which, which is called the Teach Access Curriculum Repository, a collection of over 300 open educational resources uh, that include syllabus, uh, slide decks, uh, discussion prompts, assignments, et cetera, uh, to help faculty. Faculty can adopt them, can use them as their art because they're licensed on the Creative Commons, or can modify them for their specific courses. Uh, we also have the resources at the Teach Access Curriculum Repository, which I just talked about, and self paced accessibility courses. So if you uh, are familiar with accessibility but are still grasping or, or having a little bit of a challenge grasping how can you start teaching about accessibility, you can take one of our self paced accessibility courses, which uh, gets you to think about, okay, this is what you can start teaching in human computer interaction, instructional technology, computer science, graphic design, technical writing, UX design. Uh, in a couple of months, we'll be releasing a couple of three additional courses on video game design, web development, and uh, web design. There's also one on the intro to disability and accessible design, which is a variation of the Teach Access uh, by Design program that we talked about. And uh, the other programs that we have, uh, and uh, it's a Teach Access Fellowship Program, which is a more sustained approach in helping faculty understand how they can start teaching accessibility to their students, then uh, helping them or supporting them in creating these materials to teach accessibility and in the fall, uh, teaching accessibility to their students and advocating for integrating accessibility principles into the curriculum. There's also an initiative that we, we will be launching soon, which is called Quick Fights and Connect. It's our 30 minutes workshops that uh, you can come in to learn something new about accessibility as a concept or skill. And if you have the time, you can join uh, an optional 30 minute meetup. This uh, specific program involves students, faculty, and industry partners. So that's a, uh, all for our presentation. We are going to open the room for any questions, uh, things that have not been clear, et cetera. Great, excellent. So I, sorry, I just turned off my my yeah, my video. Uh, oh, excellent! Thank you so much. I didn't know you have so many uh resources available. So we had to talk later about this uh in terms of the collaboration with heads. But right now, uh, please let us know. I'm seeing the chat. Uh, Ah, Isaris just put the, um, uh, the comment that you can share your comments and questions in the chat. So don't be shy. We have a group of almost 50, more than 50 people uh, joining us. So uh, please use the chat. If you have any comment, any doubt, any question, we still have time. I know it's a lot of information since we are not Bella acquainted with all well, the term we usually hear hear it, but we are not Bella as as acquainted of the all the dimensions and aspects of this important topic that more and more is more pertinent. Since technology is taking over in almost all of our Bella uh, areas of the uh, our life, uh, Alondra said excellent information. Thank you, Alondra, for your comment. Any other comment or? Question, this is the time now that we have here with us two experts on this topic, especially Kate uh, and Rolando and others in Teach Access. I'm so surprised of 
Okay, Dr. Alma Vega, hola Alma, how are you? Excellent presentation, great presenters. The topic is very important for academics. Totally agree, that's why we want to offer this webinar. Ah, uh, Professor Lourdes said, what is the next Teach Access by Design course? This is Rolando speaking. Our next cohort of Teach Access by Design will be in the spring. So I would recommend uh, checking out our website or social media channels. Uh, because we will be posting the information. Uh, our fall cohort is, is just about to conclude next week. So we've had a, about 50 faculty and instructional designers sign up for it and uh, learn with us about these topics. Also, we okay. forgot to mention, you don't, you don't necessarily have to engage into any of these uh, educational programs or resources, you can also connect with us. Uh, we always try to support faculty in teaching these topics to their students. We have collaborated, you know, in getting, uh, finding uh, speakers from our different industry sponsors to come into your classroom and talk about these topics. If you, the same with other types of activities that you be, be wanting to uh, do. Uh, there is another question. Thank you, Rolando, uh, from Saida Sanchez. She's asking if we are going to share the presentation. Yes, we already have the presentation in, in and we want to convert it in a PDF format. We're going to upload it at the same page that you register uh, in the menu of next and past events. You will see. In now in past events, you will see the information of this webinar and also you will have the link to go to the recording or to download the presentation so you can review the information. That's gonna be in the next two, three hours will be available. Okay, so I hope that that answered your question. Any other comment, Kate, regarding that, Rolando? If you want to put the, the link to your website also, because I bet, there is the information there. Mira, they can find more information besides the presentation on that website. Let me see. A professor Lourdes said, great, thanks, valuable information for the institutions and faculty. Remember that not only faculty, also students can benefit from it. So excellent. So help us promote this among Bella, everyone. A, also, Liz Neri said, thanks for sharing this information. Thank you for your comment. Isaris from our office, from the head's office says, remember to click to request your certificate. Please make sure you click before you go and submit your information with the correct email. So as soon as we finish this webinar and we download the recording and do all the settings, uh, we will prepare the certificates to send it and you will receive it in for email, by email, in a PDF format, and in the text of this message, you will see also the link to the evaluation of this webinar. Rolando is just right. You can view and download our slide deck there also, if you want to have the presentation ahead. And also, Saida say thanks. And Kate, just uh, write down in the chat that Teach, uh, excuse me, teachaccess.org. It's a, a non for profit organization as well as heads. So Alondra also said, thank you. Nice webinar. Germ, great information. And Isari is, is putting more information about heads. And Ruth said, I usually teach about this topic in constitutional law, but I think it should be shared to everyone. A great presentation. Thank you so much, Ruth, for sharing that. Who else? And, and Rolando, just uh, write down the link to the curriculum repository. Thank you so much. Any other comment? Any other uh, comment or any other uh, uh, question? Rolando, just add that the code for application uh, for the 2024 cohort for the fellowship program is open until November 30th. So you still have time. And he just put the link if you're interested in this. Angela said, thank you to everyone. Thank you for your time. Any other questions? In, we, still, we still have two or three more minutes, Kate or Rolando. Hey, do you want to talk about the hubs? 
Yeah. Does he have so many institutions from Puerto Rico? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want me to or you would like to? Oh, I'll leave it up to you. Do you want to take it? Okay. So one of the things, uh, thank you so much, everyone, again, for being here today. Um, something that we're interested in, and if this is something interesting to you, let us talk. Uh, but one of the things that's important to us as an organization is having um, really deep collaborations with institutions across the U.S. and Puerto Rico. Um, we as an organization are fully remote. Um, I'm based in Michigan. We have another person in Michigan and another in Tennessee in the U.S. Um, Rolando's in Puerto Rico. So we don't have an office for our organization. Um, and so one of the ways that we want to um, be able to support people in person when it makes sense is to have um, academic hubs, uh, mm -hmm. HUBS, uh, so that we are able to support faculty and students on the, on your own campuses um, and be able to um, hold a training there or be able to partner in different ways around research or scholarship that you might be doing or teaching. Um, and so we're establishing different hubs across the U.S. and would like to establish some in Puerto Rico as well. Um, so there's a lot that we could talk about, but if that's something that you might be interested in, it would not be something that would cost you any money. Um, if anything, it's us coming to you and, and being able to work with all of you um, and your faculty and your students. Um, we'd love to chat more about that um, so that we can uh, continue supporting supporting you all where you're at. Excellent. Excellent uh, offer. So please may, uh, make sure to write down their emails and their contact information if you don't have it. Also in our website, in the HEADS website, in our membership in on the corporate partners, you will find their information as well. Uh, and you can also contact us and we will be happy to share Rolando and Kate information, okay? Any other question? I don't see, oh, okay, Rolando, just write down again the information. So we are running out of time right now. So please let us know something else. If not, we are ready to stop the recording. Let me do that right away.